Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, afternoon session. So we are looking forward to a great uh, debate session. First of all, I'd like to invite our uh, wise counsel to the dais. Uh, please welcome Dr. Uh, Ajit Babu, Dr. Dinesh Talwar, Dr. Shashank Banaik, Dr. Umesh Chandra and Dr. In Unni Krishnan. Sir. So the format is that each speaker gets around four minutes or rather exactly four minutes to persuade you and uh, then we have another four minutes for a discussion and uh, inputs from our uh, wise counsel. The audience can scan this QR code put up there and the questions will directly come up here. Uh, as we have 14 speakers in this session, we'll have to be a little unforgiving about uh, time frames. So uh, with this, I'd like to invite our first speakers uh, who will be speaking on 3D imaging versus microscope, Dr. Srinivas Doshi and Dr. Dev Dulal Chakrabarti. Let me know when to start, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the entire organizing team of VRSI uh, for this opportunity. So this is the view of the surgeries I cherish. This was my uh, my father's picture operating in way back in 1960s and 70s. Now we come to the microscope based and now we are in the monitor based and the future is going to be the heads free. So we all know that most of the papers have already published by the age of 55 or 70 percent of ophthalmologists have neck, back or shoulder injuries. And now you can see operating through the microscope, the different positions, different postures. And you can see, the, they say the picture says 1000 words. So I don't have to tell much about it, but you can see the comparison of the both. You can see I'm having a good lumbar support, though it's a very simple chair. I don't have to really bother about it. And it's a fantastic teaching tool that many, many of the fellows can be taught at the same time. Now you can see here a third year resident teaching the first year resident here. Advantages, definitely, it has one of the best visualization. Every detail of the step can be explained simultaneously while operating. Can be taught to many people at the same time and it's like a kind of glorified blackboard kind of teaching. And definitely it has one of the best depth perception. So it, now it has come with the color, light profiles, temperature. Now you can view at different, different levels. Now you can, it, it, it can be integrated into the IOCT endoscopy. You can see these videos here. I try to adjust. Now how you have the home automation, you have hot colors and the cool colors. You can definitely adjust based on the fake pseudo fake a fake you can definitely decrease from the hot to cold and to see what best visualization. Yellow contrast usually have a better visualization for the ERM and the ILM. And definitely you can see this is the case where there is a red blood or you want to minimize that bloody effect of that blood. Then you can go into the reduced red, you can use a different color channels. Now you can see how these membranes are kind, trying to fluoresce like a hyperfluorescent membranes it looks like in the reduced red because the rest of the red gets suppressed. So these are the various color channels you can use and definitely you can see here uh, uh, doing an ILM peeling here. Now sometimes if you use a less dye, uh, of course, which is very important for phototoxicity using a monochrome. Now you can see with, the, with the, even the less dye also you can appreciate the edge effect very well. You don't have to have a multiple pinch and peel uh, to, uh, to have a more traumatic damage to the retina. It's easily visualized and most of the papers have already proved it. I don't have to tell more about it. And uh, the comparison uh, 3D viewing versus conventional microscope have always said that it has a good ergonomics, reduced phototoxicity, peripheral visualization is better and magnification. Comparing heads up, again, under surgery, which says that, yes, it improves the operative fluency. So the National Survey on the back and the neck pain, which has said that 78.7% .7 of the patients, uh, sorry, doctors found operating, uh, the pain was exacerbated. So these are the few of the, even in the very bad corneas also, you can definitely do a wonderful job. These are the few of the pictures of my own cases, which we have done. And we did a, a small study on the microscope versus ingenuity. And then we looked into the visualization of hazy media, restricted field of view, surgeon satisfaction. And in most of these, uh, ingenuity scored a slightly better, the 3D visualization scored better, even in case of hazy media and under air, surgeon's comfort. And definitely neck pain and the back pain, we are still on the fourth year of this trial and definitely it is having an upper edge. Ease of visualization of the membranes, the poor appreciation uh, to the excellent appreciation of the membranes is what we are looking into now. 
and we are also looking into the ease of identification of the ilm flap stained with bbg in conventional versus the 3d system that is grade one is the poor appreciation and the grade five is the excellent appreciation of the ilm flap it has a wonderful uh, uh, great educational value and say let us say that dr debulal wants to have uh, embarked a long journey right so what would be your choice of a ride dr debulal sir would you like to have a car with a good safety measures at least with the airbags and the good seat belt system or would you still prefer the age old technology mind mind you it has served us well in the past i am not demeaning that i am not defaming that but not catching up with the technology can be devastating wrong doing so this is the picture of the steve balmer who said the nokia i think it is very self explanatory i don't have to go more about it so message is if you don't change you shall be removed from the competition and lastly i would like to say dr debulal sir old may be gold but new can be platinum so we can't stop aging but we can definitely choose how to age thank you very much for the patient listening that was uh, indeed wonderful dr sinivas and uh, very good good afternoon to all of you so i'm thankful to vrsi for this i will not die without 3d so i'd like to pick up where you left technology can be devastating and i'll show you how and propagated claims and myths can be devastating so uh, these are basically the objectives i'll be enumerating the propagated myths about 3d hud and i'll do a reality check let's do a reality check all together remember segway the masaya the you know the change of you know personal transportation that was you know so hype fell flat on its face what is segway doing now mostly manufacturing bicycles the ubiquitous insulin syringe we thought this was not good enough you know this was cumbersome but we tried with this exuberator for a while inhalation of insulin this also flat on its uh, all flat on its face and uh, we are where we are back to you know using the insulin syringe we have beautiful pens now which make the job so much easier so coming back to the topic of the day 3d has potential advantages however most of these are propagated myths or claims so let's go to the first propagated myth which uh, my friend sunivas talked about 3d hud can improve surgeon ergonomics and decrease fatigue so i guess if you do a reality check operating on 3d is associated with 5 to 10 degrees of face turn to visualize the screen so is it really physiological not really look at other publications also you see the same thing you know face turn head turn everything tilt is it is this ergonomic definitely not so with experience uh, there are many experienced people here all of us have adopted a posture where wherein we can avoid these kind of back issues and we today we have you know these uh, extendable oculars also which can actually you know negate a lot of these problems let's move on the next propagated myth digital fil filters enhance visibility my friend sinivas himself said you need lesser amount of dye or triamcin now you can't do away with it so why use this blue filters actually you know with uh, show the vitreous better when tagged with triamcin acetonide color filters reduce the quantity of dye exposure this is all published in, uh, literature not my saying lower endolumination may potentially reduce macular phototoxicity wait a minute remember go back to our school days energy is equal to power into time so you have significantly longer surgery time here with 3d and what ultimately does it does is actually with increasing time you are exposing the patient to the same amount of light energy the next propagated myth 3d might facilitate or shorten procedure times now this is actually lol so macular peel time is significantly longer critical surgery time is significantly longer who says this this randomized trial like next propagated myth better teaching tool well you can you know use your analog system to get nice and crisp pictures and you can also show really good you know pictures of your surgeries to your residents to your fellows and you can you know you know teach them as well and save a lot of money one very important factor that my friend missed out was you know the assistant discomfort i've had this you know with different assistants fellows who really find it difficult to assist a buckle on the 3d they really find it difficult to do a scleral indentation on on 3d so let's move on there are other issues as well frequent focusing is necessary disturbance by media opacities surgeon has headache and nausea at the end of the day i've had 
personally. Surgeons making slower and more conservative movements. There are still other issues. Over logistics go for a toss, higher rate of malfunctions, challenge to give the anesthesia provider necessary patient access. Now, this is, I mean, terrible. So, probably what takes the cake is latency in 3D visualization. And ultimately, what all this does basically is you have more complications and uh, you know you have significant hypergenic breaks, you have pre flaps in macular hole surgeries, and more cases of retinal redetachment and post operative PVR. So, limitation of this technology also the cost of the device. However, with more than 5,500 surgeries, I am at a place where we can afford, but we thought we could utilize this money for something better. Surgeon reported ease of use was significantly higher using standard operating microscope. So I think, you know, that answers everything. So any new technology that comes in, you know, really think about it, do a reality check, and then maybe you can purchase it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, very important points, uh, especially for uh, horizontally challenged surgeons like me. We have a question for our wise Thompson. How is the learning curve and lag time on the newer 3D systems? Would like, Dr. Srinivas, would you like to uh, That's what Dr. Debulal, I think, uh, thought him to be a very senior consultant, but uh, he also has a latency in understanding. That's why it's uh, difficult for him to tell about this latency. The lat <laughs> latency, the brain perceives anything if it is less than 50 milliseconds. So the latency now they have come down with less than 50 milliseconds, which is not perceived by the brain. So now you have seen many of the users, I could have shown a vigorous movement being done also. We don't see that much of uh, latency in the newer, that is the CR4 software, what has come into it. Earlier, yes, I admit that it was a problem when it was launched, but now, no, I don't see it. The theme of the session is not this or that, but will I die without it? You don't. Know. So, so let's see. No, so we no, we already have one. System. The question is, will I die without the Mercedes or the Rolls Royce or uh, Maruti, or or an Accord or a Maruti? What level do I need? What level should I die for? That's what we are trying. Or die in style, at least. <laughs> okay, I would just, just like to make a point. Uh, the 3D systems are a technology forward, but the ergonomics are not sorted out. Yet, let's be very frank, you're still looking away at an angle, and you still have ergonomic problems with it. So, one of the most important equipment in our lives today, which I can compare now as of today, because it doesn't give you that much, it's a treadmill at your home, you hang clothes on it. In a lot of OTs now, you find the uh, 3D system in the side, and people hanging things on it because they're not comfortable with it. The ergonomics are not perfect now. There are advantages. One advantage I, I saw is that you can see more of the periphery while doing the, uh, the central work, which is a big advantage. Are we still uh, using it? Um, and I would strongly uh, say that there is, for people who have been using microscopes for years, there's no problem, with, really, there's no real problem with ergonomics there because you're so used to the system. And, and uh, the ambassador does not have a crumpled zone because it doesn't crumple. <laughs> it is a rock solid piece of equipment. It doesn't go fast. And it seems to me that we are going to buy this system so that we get less back. Are we buying it for backache or for better surgery? In terms of surgery, I don't think there's more to In terms of backache, it may be worth learning to hold your position upright while doing surgery. Maybe cheaper than spending money. Maybe if somebody takes care of even the insurance for the rest of your life, but then pay for one and Sir, one point to add, I think from the time of landers and you know, viewing laser marks through indirect visualization, 3D definitely it has changed definitely the way we perform surgeries. And uh, I think one thing, important thing is to keep doing so that simple and complex, there's nothing like simple surgeries do and complex. And definitely an excellent teaching tool in a, when you know the what kind of depth you understand and when you teach the diabetic vitrectomy or any complex surgery or simple surgery, I think it's an excellent tool. Maybe a hybrid where the surgeon works with the microscope 
but the assistants get uh, the same thing on the screen in a uh, in a 3D would be the best, which takes take, takes care of the teaching, takes care of the work, keeps the surgeon happy. If the surgeon is happier with the 3D, thank you. Yes. Best comment can come only from those people who have used both the things. It's not that if you have not used, then you can easily, uh, you know, say reverse of that. So if you have used both the things, you can comment. If you use both the things, then you can comment. Yes, sir. I'm using both the things. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next, we have Dr. Srinivas and Dr. Rakesh who will be debating on wide field imaging versus imaging with a normal camera. Let's start with you, Dr. Srinivas. Yeah, it's, it's great really to be back in uh, person with all of the all of our friends. And I took a little bit more of a positive spin on the title. Rather than die, I said, why can't I live without white field imaging? So these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, and the first point I want to make is that imaging the entire retina matters. So you know, for example, with our standard fundus camera, of course, we can get the seven standard field, but this only covers 30% of the retina. So the question is for a patient like this, is that enough? And of course, we know that in, in fact, many patients have significant disease outside in the, in the far periphery that would really impact management. In fact, we now recognize in diabetic retinopathy, there are many phenotypes, patients who have mostly central disease like this patient, but also patients who really have most of their disease in the periphery uh, like this patient. And this, actually, this difference actually really matters. Now we have hard data with protocol AA that shows that eyes that have predominantly peripheral disease, those have substantially higher risk for progression compared to those with uh, central disease, even accounting for baseline diabetic retinopathy severity level. But it's more than that. For example, here's a patient who bounced around to many retina specialists complaining of some vague visual complaints, actually had good vision. You can see there's some leakage in the macula, but the real action actually is in the far periphery of this patient. This patient actually had significant vessel staining, actually had a peripheral vasculitis, and turned out to have a connective tissue disorder they were able to diagnose. In fact, uh, you know, Quan Wen and many others have highlighted in prospective studies that ultra-wide field imaging can actually change their management decisions and have highlighted that it's critical in the management of uveitis patients. And actually, I think ultra-wide field imaging is becoming more critical as the modalities continue to expand. Now we have OCT capability where we can actually recognize these areas where otherwise we would not have appreciated the attraction. We can understand actually in these peripheral retinal pathologies uh, attraction by being able to scan uh, in these areas. In fact, Netan Chowdhury's demonstrated that the, having peripheral OCT changed his decision making in over 80% of cases, highlighting the critical importance of being able to image these areas. Of course, we can do panoramic wide field OCT, which may be important pachychoria disorders. I'll emphasize that in a talk later this afternoon. And of course, in following uh, patients with diabetic retinopathy, being able to do wide field OCT, I think, can be quite useful in this era of anti vegetative therapy. The second point I want to make is that wide field imaging is superior to ophthalmoscopy. This was a study published earlier this year by Eduardo Medina where they compared uh, ultra wide field imaging versus ophthalmoscopy with scleral depression and found excellent concordance. But of course, you get a static view with ultra wide field imaging. They suggested this as the first line diagnostic modality. And in fact, uh, that's what I do in my practice. This is an example of a patient who we couldn't dilate because they had occludable angles, they had flashes and floaters. This patient actually needed ur urgent attention because they actually had a regimentologist retinal detachment. We were able to capture through the cataract and through the small pupil because of wide field uh, imaging. So every new patient that I get gets color autofluorescence and especially critical in this, uh, in this setting. The last point I want to make though is ultra wide field uh, imaging is a critical tool to improve our practice efficiency and exam documentation. You know, why take enormous amount of time to make a retinal drawing when I can simply make take an ultra wide field picture and annotate that picture? I think that's much more instructive for explaining what's happening in the patient's side. But the bottom line is really this, right? So of course, I'm sure my opponent will argue about the expense of these technologies. But the reality is if you're going to practice ophthalmology and retina, an investment is required. It's essential. I mean, you have to have a slit lamp. You have to have an OCT. And I think the evidence is very clear. You have to have wide field imaging. Thank you. Uh, thanks to VRSI for this opportunity. So uh, listening to all the pros for the ultra wide field imaging, let us look why we need to still drive the old uh, technology and still holds true. We started back from 1926. This was the first fundus camera that came to light. Although we have evolved right now to ultra wide fields, the Mirante, the Octos and this uh, Claris, but still uh, one, one does not need to have a very ultra wide field in, in all the clinical practice era. We need to have the basic tools that is the color fundus imaging, the autofluorescence, the OCT, the FA, the ICGs, and luxury tools can be the OCT angiography and the microperimetries. 
I'll explain why the features of the normal imaging camera still hold true against the ultra wide field. First, first thing you lose your resolution while you go wide. There is no pixel loss while you look at this uh, small uh, field of view. Even the finer details can be much better appreciated and this we have been doing since long and it still uh, stands uh, tall. So better is the stereopsis you can actually perceive between the two pathologies you can differentiate the level or the plane at which these pathologies are located what you can miss in an ultra wide field imaging if you look at the pathology as a whole. So it provides you the accurate plane and you can plan your surgery accordingly. So one more uh, thing is the uh, true colors that are missed in the ultra wide fields we are getting the pseudo colors which are not actually true. So overall when you look at the quality of the image we get a better contrast with the normal fields a good stereopsis the true colors are generated which are very clear and crisp and the desired region can be obtained. Uh, one picture with, uh, which was shown by the uh, by my colleague uh, presenting the ultra wide field was the presence of the eyelashes which obstruct the field and they make the field dark you cannot actually appreciate where the pathologies you are bound to miss some of the pathologies that may be at the far periphery also. Obviously it tends to increase your duration of the imaging which is reduced while taking from the normal camera. You cannot have all the matrix functions available uh, which can be done with the help of a normal small camera. Uh, you can overlay the structure with the function like you have the structural data you can get the uh, uh, you can have the various tools like micro perimetry where you can club those and you can know what actually the function is going on like I am able to club the structure of the OPT angio uh, with the functional tool that is in micro perimetry and I can know at which point what is the function that is actually seen uh, which was not possible with the ultra wide field there is ease of availability we all know how to communicate with each other with the help of the normal data what we are getting uh, we can communicate with each other we have a common vocabulary that has been well established obviously the cost is very low which is very very important especially in the developing countries in the peripheral regions like India we have to go to the far villages uh, there should be affordability for the normal uh, general interior segment and the posterior seg segment surgeons as well. We need to screen the mass population we need to reach to each and every individual as a whole. So it, uh, it needs to be more portable as well which cannot be done at the moment with the ultra wide field. And obviously if you want to widen your field with the normal camera you can have certain attachments like the storing G which was available with the help of 20D if you keep it in front you can still widen it and obviously uh, with the help of the various softwares that are available you can create auto or the manual montage with the help of the various softwares and you can see the desired area what you are intending to even if it is in the far periphery. Uh, various friends and colleagues might be using this mobile based imaging where you can uh, see if you don't have the uh, normal camera even available. So for all those uh, uh, pros we have only single cons uh, that the widest field image was possible in one single view rest all are the pros that can be done and as the saying goes the old is still the gold. So this uh, dictum still stands tall that we have the normal camera that outclasses the ultra wide field at the moment. Thank you. My sincere regards to my mentor. Sir, you have some comments. Go ahead. Professor, um, I think what the uh, studies show was that there's a 4% increase in the number of lesions, a number of, uh, in the number of cases in which there is a treatment difference based on the analysis of the peripheral lesion. Um, it's not that you don't see additional lesions, you see additional lesions, but most of them are seen within the central uh, field stool. And so, if you really see how many times does it make a difference, it's only in 4% of the total that you, uh, that you analyze. Yeah, I, I'm not sure which study you're referring to. The uh, the original Quiche paper uh, actually cited a higher percentage than that, about 10 to 15 percent, in fact. But that's actually not even the issue now with protocol AA. Regardless of uh, the, the point is now we have randomized clinical trial data that supports that being able to identify or classify patients as having more peripheral lesions actually significantly impacts their progression rate. Again, as I said, you know, the, I showed only the all-comers, the, the 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 primary outcome analysis which showed a difference of 50% versus 30% in terms of rate of progression. So regardless of your baseline diabetic retinopathy severity level, if you're mild NPDR, moderate, severe, whether or not it's primarily peripheral significantly impacts that risk. And so that's across all comers related to diabetic retinopathy. So the previous data when we were saying, okay, you know, how often do we find lesions that would change our judgment, that was based on old clinical trial data. The latest data with protocol AA I think really highlights that, I mean, it, really the consideration, what with the discussions we're having actually in the States is mainly about, does every patient at baseline who comes in diabetic retinopathy, do they now need an ultra-wide field fluorescent angiogram? That's what we're trying to avoid doing. 
according to you. What's that? The difference is 10 percent. Because one problem is that all these studies compared the 730 degree speed. Nobody uses 30 degree speed. So even if I use a conventional camera, it could be 50 degrees at least. Anything between 50 to 60 degrees. If I take those, if I go into the periphery with these, I actually end up with a 100 degree field in virtually every case. So what you're giving me is only something beyond that. In fact, if I really look at it, what it shows best is it looks very nice for sending for an ophthalmic You get yeah. a beautiful image right. in one go. Uh, yeah. Montage can't, can't equal that. But in terms of efficacy of detection of something, like as you said, progression. So we do want to see the periphery. Can I not see that periphery? I mean, I'm asking you. I have, I don't have a wide field. By making the patient look into the periphery, can I not get the same details of the periphery with a conventional? So I'm going to say no. Uh, so you, many times in the debates, we're often asked to argue points we don't believe in. In this case, I was actually a nice. I was actually happy to do this debate because it's a, actually a point I strongly believe in. So I actually strongly have the position that you need to have ultra wide field imaging. I, you know, I, I went through the cases relatively quickly because there's an additional concept, which is that we all encounter. I mean, you know, you, patients with no media opacity dilate widely. Sure, you can you can get great imaging with your standard fundus camera, but that's not the reality in our clinical practice. We have many patients who dilate poorly. Patients have significant media opacity. And in those cases, it's invaluable. Uh, and so, so again, you know, as I said, we use it, every new patient gets an ultra-wide field image, a color and an autofluorescence. I can't tell you how many patients we picked up on subtle abnormalities. Autofluorescence provides tremendous contrast, uh, things that might be difficult. Some patients are difficult to examine. Uh, and so there's so many cases that we've seen in clinical practice where, uh, where our management has been impacted, which again, you know, people have done prospective studies that have verified that. So it's not just diabetic retinopathy, because I mean, I know that that's the major disease we may be contending with, but there's a whole host of diseases. So I would respectfully um, disagree with that and say that I, I think that it is essential. So I actually argued the position I believe in. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, next, uh, uh, do you have a question? You'll have to be quick, please. One more thing I wanted to tell about this, which was not discussed. Uh, in ultra wide field uh, photography, it is using lasers actually. So for seeing choroid, it is best and specifically in periphery. We can't see uh, periphery choroid with any of these machines except this ultra wide field machine. So in that, if we want to differentiate between whether the pathology is there in retina or choroid, we can definitely better see in ultra wide field uh, modality, which is not possible with a uh, normal one. Even though we are going with montage, we can't see whether it's in a choroid or retina. But here we can see with uh, different modulations, it is available. Uh, I would go slightly against that because with the help of Heidelberg, if you take the peripheral pictures, that gives a better view with the high resolution. And you can actually club those pictures and get a better view of the choroid rather than having only as the ultra wide field uh, taking the choroidal scan. I just want to uh, counter one point about resolution because all the other technologies they are using actually LED flash. So here in ultra wide field modality, they are using lasers. So this is having better resolution with better penetration and instead of all the technology, whichever, whichever cameras you say, they all are using only uh, this LED flashes. So okay. LED flash can't penetrate below the retina. Resolution has nothing to do with the laser versus LED flash. It is basically the pic, pic, uh, principle of the picturography. Picture. Yes. You can ask uh, even a normal camera person, he will tell you. Yes. Smaller the size, better the resolution. It is always inversely proportional to that. Very true. So, very physics for you have a comment? Yeah, yeah one yeah, question I have. Yes. Uh, what is the number of times that if you have a peripheral lesion that you miss it on the uh, wide field imaging, but you pick it up on the indirect ophthalmoscope? Yeah, that, that was, uh, again, I'm sorry, I went so fast. So the Eduardo Medina paper that was published earlier this year looked at that. So there are some cases that you would miss. One of the things that, again, maybe we don't have to keep the, the bell keeps ringing, so maybe we don't have time. But one of the things in our protocol, when the photographer has problems with lashes, things of that sort, they'll steer the image. So typically, when I, before I see the patient, they'll have the central image and they'll have a superior and inferior steered image. And then the miss rate, I think, is substantially less. So the miss rate is really dependent on what instructions you've given to your imaging team uh, to make sure you have adequate um, imaging obtained. But for certain, there can be patients all the way at the parse planar that you may miss. I think a uh, detailed clinical examination is missing with these both the technologies with wide field. Most of us going to go for wide field first and then examine. 
a detailed examination is missing in the clinic in most of the time and the new resistance which are going for they are more machine dependent rather than an uh, examination dependent which we need to and the second is the change of versions of the wide field you invest in one version and the second version comes and the cost is exuberant uh, in a clinical practice, it becomes very difficult for the practitioners to update their words. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next, we are uh, having Dr. Uh, Madan Gopalan and Dr. Nageshwar Rao. We'll be talking about uh, vitrectomy systems, basic vitrectomies versus the advanced versions. Please start. And the audio visual person please help us around. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to VRSI and uh, the scientific committee for having me here. So, well, today I'll be debating four vitrectomy machines, the basic ones. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to state that the so-called basic ones are not so basic anymore. They have up to 10,000 cut rates. They give us, uh, you know, laser in the same foot pedal. They give us controlled visco injection, just as you would inject uh, silicon oil. But if I had to, you know, scrutinize it very strictly, then I would say probably these are the three technical aspects where the so-called basic uh, instruments would come second. One is the rate of cuts, IOP control under air and the field of illumination of their light bulbs. So when it comes to rate of cuts, I'd like to ask how much is enough? Or rather, how much is too much? So I have I've basically lost count of the rate of cuts these days. But uh, you know, we all know about the concept of duty cycles where the port has to be open for a certain amount of time to actually grasp the vitreous and remove it. By the look of things, we are going so far that we are soon going to be skimming the vitreous without removing anything or doing anything meaningful. I'm sure uh, the panel here would agree with me. They would have been trained with 2,500 cut rates and they were doing a good job. When it comes to the next two points, IOP control under air and field of illumination, all that is required is we need to proceed slowly, have a little patience, and anticipate things before they happen. Don't wait for things to happen and then react. That would require a little bit of time. Come on, we're all VR surgeons. We're not competing with cataract surgeons. Try and finish the surgery in 10 minutes or 5 minutes. So people tell me, hey, time is money. If you can spend some money and save some time, you should be doing it. But I tell them, if you can spend a little bit of time and save a huge amount of capital, well, you should be doing that. This has been debated already. If you want to get from point A to point B, you can do it in either of these. People often talk about comfort and safety. But I say comfort and safety is with the driver in as much as it is with the machine. It is with the surgeon in as much as it is with the machine. This is not something that I said, but I'll give a twist to it. Price is what you pay and vision is what your patient is going in. Again, I like to take the cataract surgeons here. We're not competing for 6-6 six, six or 6-5 six, on day one. That's not our job. That's probably where a machine would help you to achieve what you want. But we're all VR surgeons. We like to you know achieve excellence and like to give utopian surgical outcomes, but the elephant in the room is often not addressed. What is the price? What is the cost paid to get there? So the way I see it, this debate is, will I die without it? So if, if given the option, if I can get the same surgical outcomes, I'm prepared to spend a little more time in the war, provided that is what is required to give me peace of mind and help me sleep peacefully in both professional and financial aspects. Yes, few of them talk about personal comfort over everything else. Well, that's a different category altogether. But these days, surgeons, entrepreneurs, and organizations have a lot on their plate. Have a really lot on their plate to take care of. And this is where our Indian machines, in our scenario, they give us a huge helping hand. So finally, the bottom line, I'm sure we all know what the verdict is and the wise counsel would agree with me. In 9 out of 10 VR cases, the machine does not matter. In 9 out of 10 VR cases, the machine doesn't matter. And in that last case, Nothing here. Thank you.
गुड आफ्टरनून एल बी सी एडवांस विथ एक्ट एल बी सी एनी वे दैट डेवलपमेंट ऑफ ऑफ द टेक्नोलॉजी द टेक्निक्स ऑफ बी एस एग्री मेनली दफ रिसेंट विथ एक्ट एल बी सीम्स डेफिनेटली चेंज दिनारी ऑफ डीलिंग विद विटेस एग्री नो अंडली I'll be speaking mostly. I'll be speaking the features of uh, punctuation BC because I use that and most of us use that. So the pump system, venturi uh, nowadays, all the machines are mostly use uh, venturi system. The static has gone, almost gone. Some machines they combine with that venturi system keeps the actually uh, uh, what you can uh, work at a high suction or system. Uh, and uh, this integrated pressurized infusion with iop compressed is a major advantage of this machine which keep the iop at a certain level or a preset level so that uh, the eye doesn't get collapse during surgery and when extraction begins the gradient starts the machine senses a drop in pressure and compensate by forcing more fluid into the eye which is again uh, it's automatic uh, sensor system which is helpful during surgery and in fact in the constellation machine two chambers are there one is primary and secondary the primary works At a uh, most of the time, and the fluid comes down or the drop. Uh, actually, it finishes the second read, gets started, and in fact, uh, we observe that even uh, in the bottle, uh, 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 the fluid gets off in the bottle or the finishes. Suddenly, the air that never enters to the eye. That is a major advantage of these machines, which earlier we were having problem with those machines. And uh, in fact, the benefits of an enhanced fluid is the uh, there is no pressure to during instrument exchange. Which reduces the chance of incarceration, tissue incarceration, retinal incarceration, and uh, no chance of eye collapse during, and the ability to operate the low pressure. This is the major advantage. And the eye usually doesn't get myos. The people corneal edema is less than intraoperative bleeding also less than. And the evolution of the cutters are measured nowadays with the we cut with the very thin cutters with the high suction and. Uh, And the dual uh, pneumatic system in the constellation is a great advantage in the contrast to the spring-driven cutters, where the dual uh, of the duty cycle of the port remains closed most of the time. With the cut rate increase, the port will remain closed in the earlier cut uh, uh, cutters. But nowadays, it's a major advantage. And this, with this cutting or bevel tip, you can go very close to the retina and cut. There is less chance of in car setting the retina or the cutting the retina and the duty cycle uh, in the earlier cut section because the spring driven the duty cycle was most of the time port remaining closed but in the new 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 systems the port remains open because of the two pneumatic driven uh, forces and in fact in the two dimensional two directional cuts also there that works in 2000 even and uh, the uh, this one what the, the port remains open this is again with a high cut The suction rate is also flow rate is also remains very good in the modern machines. Uh, the the equation of uh, length that the pull and the collagen fibrils is equal to the flow rate by, by divide uh, the lumen area and cut rate. That means the flow rate whenever the flow rate will increase, that the, the length of the we, we can pull the vitreous more. But with the system of uh, higher cut rates, this one the pull of the uh, the vitreous pull is lessened. But that, uh, with the with the newer machines, this flow rate they have adjusted. So we can with a higher cut rate, you can go and uh, 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 pull, pull, pull the vitreous sufficiently. And uh, high flow rate always will not be desirable. Increase the risk of retinal tear. And 27 inch strokes generate smallest tissue effect resistance because of sphere of influence. This is the very good, uh, uh, but, uh, but this one what mechanics which is incorporated in the constellation machine sphere of influence. The uh, thinner gauge uh, cannulas. The uh, thinner gauge uh, 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 cut uh, uh, this one with uh, cutters, the sphere of influence is very less, so that uh, you can go to the you can go to the retina very close and uh, do uh, the surgeries. You can manipulate the surgeries. And this valve cannulas, certainly they have advantage over the earlier because turbulence will be less during surgery. And that important aspect of proper seal reflex in the constellation machine, where you can dissect the membrane, which will be very adherent to the retina. Underneath the membrane, you can go and inject some fluid so that it separates very well. It's very good uh, technology. And uh, in fact, uh, endo illumination and chandelier system, which has increased the 
based on what uh, you can uh, independently indent the retina and uh, you cannot depend on the assistant to indent. So this is candle system. The surgical wide angle is already discussed very widely. So okay, all about we'll the have to more Thank you. Thank yeah. you. We'll have to wind up. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, Dr. Oni would like to add. Yeah, this uh, uh, mobile phones, digital SLR cameras, LASIK machines, and vitrectomy machines is about showing how much MP it has, how much cut rate it has, what is the repetitive rate. So it is all the number marketing game over there. Uh, as you said, there is a particular level that all these advanced machines offer you, and what we should be looking at is the safety features they offer you. Does a machine have any particular safety feature for IOP control, for flow control, and all those things, rather than just the numbers game? All of us have started with uh, so-called basic machines. You've got so used to it, and when somebody says, buy that machine, you say, I'm happy with my machine. Till you become unhappy and you upgrade, then you are happy with that machine. Until when the cycle of four months, four years of EMI and four years of CMC gets over and you have to change your next machine, that is how the eternal cycle of ophthalmological things run around. But anyway speaking, all of us would love to have a great machine. Some of us get used to a particular machine and we're quite happy with it. The debate of whether you can live without or whether you'll die with it, oh, I'm still confused with the title. You know. So essentially, we get used to what we have. We always want to upgrade. When we upgrade, the most important point is not looking at the numbers like uh, 10,000 cuts or 20,000, looking at the safety profile. Do they ever offer you anything that makes surgery more safer? Could be a more uh, relevant way of looking at it. Will, will this create the main without it, you're asking, would my patients be more unsafe without it? The fact is that with any machine, the man behind the machine who decides how much unsafe you're going to be. And you can adjust every parameter, including shaving. I have done the most complex surgeries with even upper swami basic machine. So it's not that you can't do that. But you have to change the paradigm of man. With the correct paradigm, you'll be able to do for example, you have pressure adjusted. So you know you can add, you can add, you can for pressure of 20. <clears throat> you don't have that, you can bring the bottom down right down to the level that gets gives you the same at one. But don't but the problem comes in the transition when persons move from an old machine to a new machine and continue to use older paradigms, they actually take all the disadvantages of the new machine. They don't get the advantages. And when you're doing it with a new machine and then you suddenly go to an old machine without realizing that now you've gone to a older machine, you have to bring yourself back and think, now how does this paradigm change for management? Whether it's valve cannula, whether it is cutting rates, whether it's infusion bottle heights, everything changes depending on the machine you are using. And the important thing is you are safe with any machine provided the man behind the machine Thought over every aspect of this. Certainly, sir. Yeah. Uh, the newer advances are mainly aimed at an average. Any good surgeon can handle with old machines or new machines. Only dynamics we need to understand and make it clear is for an average surgeon. And only changing the machines do not serve the purpose. And second is the how much economic burden are you going to have in practice with changing the machine also need to be uh, calculated. He has brought a very uh, pertinent point actually. In practice, you cannot keep changing the machines and uh, the new newer machines are coming with some disablement of the old uh, advantages which the older machines are having. This is also we need to keenly observe and uh, we need to tell the pharma to maintain that older advantageous parameters. This is very, very essential. Otherwise, the fast changing, some uh, advantages we are losing rather than gaining with the modern technology. I will just add one last that we all know what happened in February of 2019. Amit 21 was brought down, Amit 21 brought down a F6. So it is not the machine. And behind the machine. The man yeah. behind the machine. The man behind the machine. Thank you. Behind. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have uh, Dr. Chitra uh, Jaydev and Dr. Romano, and they'll be talking about. Uh,
imaging true color and multi color thank you thank you you know you know pronounce it wrong yeah wrong chaitra chaitra jaydev you can come over here man so we are going off gear we both had an out of court settlement over coffee and we both decided to go pro multi color imaging so we are not arguing here we're just going to tell you how good multi color imaging is because you've already seen the true color imaging you've seen wide field you've seen small field so we're only just going into multi color imaging can i do without it uh so yes this is the device that i'm using and romana is using another device so he'll be speaking about that so we have multi modal diagnostics all of this but we are only looking at multi color imaging now because it allows simultaneous scanning with infrared green and blue laser it gives us a composite image like this and the blue reflectance gives us more uh, vitro retinal interface uh, diseases green gives us the retinal integrity and uh, the ir gives us the rp or the choroid or the melanin so we are able to get uh, you know a lot of information with what one imaging modality so what is the evidence that we have what are the cases so this is a beautiful image of uh, cscr you can see how well in 3d literally you can see the uh, en entire extent of the lesion and so easy to explain to your patient look at this this is a neovascularization why would you ever want to do anything other than multicolor imaging when you can image it so well and uh, more importantly you can also show response to treatment and it's non invasive and can be taken in a couple of minutes uh these are uh, you know vein occlusion images you can see uh, non perfusion there beautifully you can even see cystoid spaces there you know so it's so important an imaging tool for us to uh, get overall information this is one of our patients uh, with uh, albinism you can see that the foveal reflex is completely gone on the upper images compared to the ones below so we did a quick study on looking at the multicolor uh, imaging for uh, trds and how useful it is So you can see the color image there, not showing you any of the fibrovascular proliferation, but the multicolor imaging is showing a very good delineation. This is another case here. Again, you can almost look at the uh, membranes that are so elevated. Helps us definitely in uh, surgical planning and in uh, conjunction with an OCT, even better. So this is again another image. Uh, what we found was uh, multicolor imaging does help us identify the extent and morphology. gives better delineation of the pathology and helps in surgical planning as well so to quickly compare between conventional color fundus photography that's white light with flash here is three monochromatic lasers as 45 degrees here you can go up to 55 in one single image here there are four uh, images taken simultaneously these are two dimensional on uh, color fundus whereas here we get an almost 3d topographical information their dilatation is recommended whereas with multicolor you can do many patients without dilatation and even with poor media you're able to get uh, you know good amount of information so this is a very interesting image this is just a color photo if you look at the multicolor it's the same eye same retina look at the amount of information you can get so it's really fantastic it adds a new dimension actually to color imaging you can visualize structural defects you can uncover topographic information that's not seen on color fundus photography outstanding contrast as you saw on all these images discrimination of structures is possible increase comfort and reduce examination time so this is an image that is such a good reflection of the angiography in terms of even looking at the ischemia and this is another multicolor imaging yes i cannot do without multicolor imaging but i will definitely not die my patients thank you so much So we have to agree. Um, I'm a big fan of the multicolor imaging. I do have some. I, we do scan. We do uh, photograph some patients with the true color in some time. There are several machines today, that, including the Mirante as well, that put it in in there. But you can see the difference between the angles and, and the and the, um, the corresponding eye angle of the, these patients. These are the machines that we have in in the clinic. Uh, we're not uh, so we use mostly the uh, the, the, the Heidelberg and the Adam. We we also do the uh, Optos and Stiris, not so much. This is the the difference between in in field of view of these patients of these uh, machines, and, and and as regards in uh, color FFA FFF for one. So this is just a, a clinical uh, video just to show the difference between those two. The true color technology versus the traditional fundus camera. 
you can see the image quality is much better in sharpness, richness, and details. And there, here's a patient of cataract uh, in, in the right, in both eyes. And you can see that the, the, the true color is way much better. You can see the details of the epiretinal membrane. Uh, furthermore, uh, you can appreciate in this case in here, you can really see the, the membrane. You can measure the membrane better in, in the, the true color uh, compared to the color of color photography. As, as you've seen that we, we can uh, individualize the color channel of patients uh, and test with the epiretinal membrane. And, and same thing in here. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, it, it was a it was a very very nice mutual exclusive yeah. event, yeah. and we seem probably happy and peaceful. Yeah. And let me just point out that um, uh, when you're talking about true color, I just got it because the true color is a color that we mentioned in a four channel uh, thing. And a multi color is when you have a three channel when you talk about the hiding birds. Yeah, you're going on and on supporting each other when I just sit in the coffee break. Yeah. Yeah. So. So just to make a point, the, the multicolor of this spectralis has, in, uh, you get benefits from the uh, topographic and elevation data, which in true color you get more realistic tissue uh, information. Uh, the multicolor, however, has a problem of obscuring and masking certain RP pigmentations and probably You can totally miss a probably leave us sometimes for multicolor, which would pick up on our examination. Of this. So these are some of the disadvantages of multicolor. That is, if we uh, sometimes you miss deeper patients. The true color is just like a better reflection of your color photography. You pick up membranes, you pick up the details well, and that's the optimal use of the uh, four channels of uh, wavelengths of light. Both are CSL bases. Yeah. Yeah, for those cases, uh, right. Really was, then, I think that question is not being answered by either of us. You're not talking about, I mean, multicolor has the advantage of having those different reflectances which give you different parameters. Both also have, if you put them together and you lose that, you get it. So, what I, what I want to know is if I have to see a picture, should I prefer to see it as a multicolor image or should I have a camera, same view, same everything? Should I take a true color? No, so multicolor does give you better. Yeah. Uh, did you ever see the red free images with a uh, color photograph comparison? So my topic was Without on MCI. Yeah. So I've done on MCI, but we do use. We have challenges yeah. with MCI. It's not that it's perfect. Yeah. But I'm just saying if for the debate, we I basically prepared on the MCI. But we do use uh, true colors. Well. Uh, red free, red free with true color comparison. You are almost getting all the details which you can get with multicolor. In addition, you are not losing the deeper uh, lesions. That is big advantage, which we are not using in the clinical practice. Usually, uh, always you need to compare, take a color photograph, red free photograph, and if at all in selective lesions, you go for auto close. You are getting all the information which you are claiming in multicolor. So sometimes we need to enlighten the delegates these aspects. Otherwise, the basic uh, capability of us in performing the clinic is really coming down. We are going for, okay, you get all the questions. I will now see you in the consultation. That's where we are going. I, I just wanted to add one one thing. Uh, first of all, the, the the terminology true color is mostly a marketing thing from the different companies, right? So 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 I guess the thing to keep in mind is there is the color that we perceive using our slit lamp systems when we examine the patient, and many of us in our mind think true color is something that faithfully reflects when I examine the patient. The photograph I obtain does something similar. So so that. Uh, traditional fundus cameras probably have done the best job of replicating that. All of these other systems, they have various differences and advantages. I think Andre and Shaitha both highlighted the confocality matters, right? So you have, like for example, the uh, the, um, the the IDEN system. That is a confocal system. It uses a confocal slit, not a confocal pinhole, but it, it's white light LED. The Zeiss Claris is a is also a white light LED, but it's a non-confocal system. 
And then you have the Nidec Marante, which is RGB confocal. And then you have, but it's, but you know, you, you can call that multicolor actually. And then Heidelberg's multicolor substitutes red with IR. So you have all these variations. Each of them have different advantages. They present information differently. So you need to understand the differences. Uh, but overall, I would say that if you want to have better contrast for fundus imaging, confocality matters. So all of the confocal methods are going to give you a better picture in the setting of media opacity. And so I really think, I know I made a point of it in the other talk, but we have to think about media opacity and some of the real issues where we're actually obtaining imaging in a patient. I would just make those clarifications. Yeah, except for in uh, cases where the media is hazy and you want to have a greater detail of that, probably the light so. That is the confocality is mainly because of the light source, not because of other uh, parameter. Well, confocality is only because of the pinhole, right? So yeah. either you have a circular or a slit pinhole, or some of the devices let you have all sorts of different mod modulations of the aperture where you can get retroilluminated light and the, and the like. So the confocality comes from the pinhole. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaitra and Dr. Romano. Next, we have Dr. I'll invite Dr. Ramandeep and Dr. Rohan talking about intraoperative OCT versus conventional vitrectomy. It's not the machine, but yes, the surgeon. Can you have the mic here for the speaker? Yeah. I'm audible. Yeah, sorry about that. That so uh, I knew that it's going to come. You know, it's not the machine, but the surgeon behind the machine matters. I totally agree with that. Why are we we are changing the into new model of cars every year, every third year? We buying a new car. Why aren't we taking our patient in that in the same car for a ride? So I believe that technology does matter. If we are changing our machines to change for the patient betterment. We are not Van Diesel. Only Van Diesel can win a you know a race in Brazil with a broken car of his cousin actually. So what happens is where it's a two die situation is in my hand I know everything works well. But what about the fellow where where we are training the fellows? The fellow is doing this vitreous hemorrhage eye now. Uh, he he encountered this at the back. You know this is this is what he or she is encountering. So. This is how the MIOCT is going to help a new surgeon also. That he may die if he creates a break because next day he's going to show to me. I will ask him why did you put oil in this patient? Why did you put gas in this patient? So he will be able, he or she will be able to see clearly the planes where the dissection is to be done. Of course, I again said experience does matter. But yes, my use of Trimestone and dyes will also become less because I am able to see the second membrane there with my with my MIOCT and very clearly. Yes, for fellows, I think it is it is more important. I need not use a a a, a, a trimestone or, or or a dye in these patients before I uh, finish these patients. The other this is this is a good example. A fellow is operating at somewhere eight o'clock in the uh, night. And she thought this is a, you know, she took it as a, a case of a exudate and she saw this at the back and she was about to call me, then she ran an OCT and she could see that now it's a person like picture, it's nothing to, without the OCT, a young fellow can be always in doubt whether I should touch this membrane, is it an exudate there, whether I should try to remove the hyaluron. So this is a two die situation for her, she actually would have called me or done some kind of a, you know, a break there. And this one, two die movement. We all are going to use in, in, in our practices the gene therapy there. It is a, it is a multi crore therapy, maybe whenever it comes to India. The use of MI OCT can provide feedback on the accuracy of the injection. You don't want to give this injection in adrenally in the choroid or in the you know vitreous cavity. So who will help us? So this is an example where the TPA is being pushed subretinally. This is just an example how we are going to do a gene therapy in the future because we're going to uh, push in uh, our, our gene therapy and you will look the blood forming right in front of your eyes uh, uh, when we are injecting with a, a 40 g uh, cannula and this is right in front of uh, your eyes and you there's no chance of making any any mistake and uh, uh, because you know that now you can sleep well that i have injected the dye at the, at the right place and another example you can of course you know uh, you know have a car and you can use it for other purposes like your pediatric cases, you don't have to buy another OCT there. Just by doing a trans illumination, 
you know, I can do use my MIOCT the, uh, for a pediatric uh, cases where I want to look at their uh, retinas in case of, uh, uh, you know, what is happening to the retina, is it normal, is it, uh, is it uh, CME there? So, so many examinations in the anesthesia we, we perform. So MIOCT will help us in that. And of course, these ca cases, they look good when you present them somewhere. So this is one such case, you know, the, we did the neurosensory flap. I mean, just, this is just a, not a to die moment, but looks good actually, how we raise the flap and how uh, you, you will see the uh, flap being moved uh, to the center. And uh, this is, this is, you can exactly make up what is happening here. So in God, we all trust, all others must bring data to uh, whether I'm right or wrong. Thank you. Good afternoon. So like my worthy opponent has said that it does look good, but does it actually help? So let us have a look at that. Before we adopt any technology, we must test it. We must be sure that it works and it does actually make life easier. And does it actually uh, increase any learning aspect from that? So let us have a look at some of these aspects. So you see, when you start using this technology, it's not as easy. Sometimes the focusing is not easy. And you will need another person in the OT who would have to focus it properly before you can actually get an image. So it increases surgical time. Then you see this case of a routine case of a macular hole with some epiretinal membrane. I have switched on the IOCT here. But am I getting any extra information? No. The ERM was clearer just by the dye itself. Now this is the case of vitromacular traction. And I am removing the uh, posterior hyoid and the traction. And then I switch on the OCT to see at these folds at the macula. But again, any extra information do I get? No. I don't feel that there is an extra ERM there or something. And anyway, I was going to peel this ILM. And even if I shift my OCT to the area where there is a bleed, the bleed I know is already there on the surface of the retina. What is there underneath? No advantage of the OCT. This is the case of this pit. Now this information of the retinal shiasis and the fluid was always there with me pre-operatively before the surgery. I'm stopping this ILM in the pit and trying to see whether the OCT can help me place it better. But I think manually and uh, analyzing it on the microscope itself is better than what the OCT actually shows. Another case of optic disc pit where we uh, did a vitrectomy and this was before the ILM peeling time where we were trying to suck the fluid from the pit itself. Now does the OCT show me any absorption of fluid or does it help me in showing me what is the end point? No, the OCT still keeps showing me the same shises and I do not think I got any extra advantage in this surgery by switching on the IOCT. Uh, uh, going on to the next cell is the case of ROP. So I've done some peripheral uh, dissection and there is some posterior traction on the posterior pole. Focusing the OCT on that shows me that there is traction and there is fluid, but I'm not going to touch that anyway. So again, no extra advantage. A diabetic patient where I've cleared the posterior pole, but there is some remnant traction around the arcades. Now the instruments disturb the visualization there. I do not actually get the plane because of the OCT which my opponent showed, but I got it because of my own experience. Now, in a periphery, I thought I might have created an hydrogenic hole and I'm trying to focus the OCG to see whether it was a hole or not. Again, the imaging was not clear and I anyway ended up driving that doubtful area. So I did not actually get a very good advantage by the OCT. So also, is it actually required? You see this case with the posterior pole detachment. You see this shisen, vitreous shisen and this thin layer there. You can see it best under the microscope. You can do the peeling with your ILM forceps and it's the surgeon who's trying to identify the plane. Even if I had switched on the OCT here, I don't think it would have showed me that very thin line above the retina. So once you keep peeling, you again can get the entire uh, vitreous plane better and remove it and then go ahead and again do the ILM peeling in a routine manner without uh, shifting to the IOCT. And once you do the ILM peeling, you can see that that entire area has been peeled off and you can settle the retina. But case of post vitrectomy dense epiretinal membrane. Now if you feel that I'm having problem identifying a plane of entry there, I simply go to the periphery where the membrane is thin and I start peeling there and along with the ILM, I'm going to start peeling the membrane from the side and bring it on to the center. Again, the OCT was not going to show me that area, that plane. And again, the peripheral attachments, I have to use my own experience to be handling them also along with handling the central membrane and not just keep pulling on the 
central membrane. Otherwise, I might create a peripheral break somewhere. This is a case of a dense vitreous hemorrhage. Now, again, I'm pulling on the fibrovascular proliferations. Now, again, this is the surgeon's experience which tells him or her that here you can pull, you will not create a break. But here, please use your scissors and don't pull too much or you will create a break. And in the end, you end up doing a nice surgery and even an ILM peel. And you, under this ILM, you have this fluid there because it was a tractional detachment. And the retina is a bit mobile. But again, the OCT will not give me any extra advantage. If I have to peel, I have to peel. And that's my experience which tells me how to go about it. Now, another case which my worthy opponent showed of a subretinal injection. So here again, I'm with a 41 gauge doing a subretinal injection. I do not need the OCT. I know once the giveaway is there and the injection will be uh, going through and the drug will be in the right place. So in analyzing, we must do a SWOT analysis. The so strength of this IOCT, yes, it is an appealing technology and it has the ability to see these individual retinal layers. But the current generation operators, I think, does not have enough good resolution and there is problem with instrument shadowing. But yet, it has opportunities once we develop instruments which do not cause shadowing and the uh, resolution improves. And if we take T as the translational ability, then I think where my opponent said, yes, in future subretinal injections and to play, know the accuracy of the placement of those, it might have some role. But currently, is intraoperative OCT pass or fail? I would say it's probably failing at the moment. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience or any comments? So very drool worthy surgery, both of you. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we uh, next we'll have I'd like to invite Dr. Stewart and Dr. Mishra. They'll be talking about OCT angiography versus conventional angiography and ICD. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much to the organizing committee. And uh, let me give my uh, uh, honors to uh, our wise counsel here as they uh, listen to the two of us discuss this debate on OCT angiography versus fluorescein and ICG. Uh, this is a very broad field. And giving it four minutes obviously doesn't give it its due. But let's talk about three common conditions and the difference in information we get from these different imaging modalities. Uh, there's no doubt that OCTA uh, has made a big impact in our field. Uh, the different machines will give us slightly different information. They'll give, depending on location of the lesion, uh, they'll give us different scanning speeds. Um, but when you look at, in totality, what is our ability to diagnose macular neovascularization with OCTA, there's quite a variability in terms of our sensitivity and specificity. And so it is not as good as gold standard, which is dye-based angiography. Uh, and there are limits to OCTA. Uh, you can see that their projection of motion artifacts and segmentation algorithms limit our ability to see all of the membranes. If we have the ability to go into the imaging room and do the segmentation ourselves, we're probably going to do better. But in a busy practice, that's a difficult thing to do. And I point you to the bottom of this slide, which came out of a review this year, where the authors concluded that current evidence does not fully support the exclusive use of OCTA in the diagnosis of macular neovascularization in the neovascular AMD population. So let's look at one specific variant of AMD, and that's polypoidal. Uh, we know that ICG angiography is the gold standard for polypoidal uh, neovascularization. However, ICG is time consuming. Uh, it's difficult on the patient. It's more challenging for the technician. And so as a result, it's not always the, the diagnostic modality of choice. And the, uh, the committee was convened to evaluate the ability of OCT in, a, in diagnosing um, polypoidal. Uh, Dr. Sada was on this committee, as Dr. Well, as Dr. Gupta, and the, the bottom line of this was it's about 90% effective when you look at the major three diagnostic criteria from OCT, and that is the sharp pigment of field attachments, the sub-RPE ring, and the multi-lobar pigment of field attachments. 
So 90% is pretty good, but you will lose 10% of your lesions not being able to diagnose them. So what about diabetic retinopathy? Well, for decades, fluorescent angiography and color photography have been our standards. But let's look at the three different versions of diabetic retinopathy and see how OCTA and dye-based angiography come into play. So diabetic macular edema, I think most of us would agree that fluorescein probably doesn't contribute a whole lot to, ICU, to the treatment of diabetic macular edema. And there's no doubt that OCTA does a really good job in looking at, at non-perfusion. Now, non-perfusion is not a limiting factor for whether we treat patients, but it is a factor in terms of giving patients a good idea of their prognosis. Um, what about diabetic retinopathy? There certainly is interest in treating peripheral disease, or there's no unanimity as to whether we should do it, but these are based on color photographs. And even patients who have wide field angiography to treat diabetic macular edema by PRP, that comes up short and fails. So we really don't see much advantage in angiography for the diagnosis and treatment of, di of peripheral disease in terms of are we getting high severity patients. Uh, but what about the last one? Proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And Dr. Sada made an interesting point when he said there's a debate in the US as to whether or not every patient should get a wide field fluorescein at baseline. The fact that it's being debated says there's certainly advantages to picking up peripheral disease. And finally, talk about uveitis. Well, OCTA comes up very short because it doesn't give us function. And when you look at some of the data from some of the comparative studies, you find that not only does OCTA come up short, but even standard fluorescein angiography, which sort of gives us that 30 degree that OC, most OCTA would cover, comes up short because half of the patients with posterior uveitis would have a change in their disease based upon wide field fluorescein angiography. So in summary, for neovascular AMD, diabetic retinopathy, particularly proliferative retinopathy, as well as posterior uveitis, I think you can see that the addition of fluorescein and ICG angiography, in addition to OCT, gives you your best information and actually your best ability to both diagnose and manage patients to the best of our ability. Should I start? Should I start? So, hello everyone. Uh, my statement is uh, FA and ICJ, I live with, live with this. I believe all the delegates who have uh, registered for this conference will agree with me and I have to support all of you. Number one, leak from the NBE. So, this is practically what we are meeting. NBE leak, we see there is progression. It's not con like a virtual meeting or something in OCD, you have to think over it. So that is the biggest advantage. Number two, something like predominantly peripheral leaks. We have heard about this in recent DRCA.net publications also. In OCTA, we have maximum 12 into 12. However, if you want to go beyond 100 degree or say uh, uh, vertex band ampulla, this FFA, especially the white field uh, FFA helps us. And these are the publications supporting that. Another important thing, astral hyalosis, diagnosis of PDR. This is definitely needed FFA, needed. OCTA will not help you in this. Detecting microaneurysms, one of the earliest signs. FFA is more sensitive than OCTA. There are N number of publications. PD and PCV, especially when they are coexistent with diseases like diabetic retinopathy, you have to take the help of ICG to detect a, a hotspot or a uh, BVN or something. You cannot go away with the only uh, OCT based classification by uh, Dr. Jamie Chung et al. that was uh, um, described before. CSR, you have to go for FFA, you have to see the smokestack or uh, the ink blot leak, and sometimes you may get in the ICG hyperfluorescence also. Coming to AI and FFA, there are recent publications where they have proved that automatic anal analysis of FFA images with the help of this will help in the future management of diabetic retinopathy. The concerns, machine cost, yes, artifacts, maximum reach is 12 into 12 only. Inter-observer variation, there have been a number of publications where the agreement is less, okay, it's not very good. 
again coming to adverse reactions of ffa is it really a high magnitude let's see like always they say that in massive there will be anaphylaxis death that is the ultimate so in general anesthesia then like daily hundreds and thousands of surgeries are happening whatever the rate of death is that is equivalent to ffa so if you want to abandon ffa we have to probably abandon the ga thing so in summary ffa is among the time tested investigations in the management of dr and many other diseases like peripheral disease phcr fvr and angiomas icg helps in the other coexisting diseases especially pcv octa yes it adds value to the armamentarium however octa replacing ffa is something like i'll tell you one analogy like we had a gentleman uh, our uh, talaiwar mr rajnikan from 1996 onwards he has been telling that i will enter into politics but uh, like that for one decade we have been listening oct is going to replace ffa replace ffa so probably last year or something he told that no i am not going so the statement about oct here replacing ffa we are yet to uh, listen to thank you seems to me that both the speakers uh, yeah. were interested in speaking for ffa and icg and nobody wants to talk about oct i think we are forced to come to a situation where the um, does it seem to talk about it or Tanu needs to talk about whether OCA has any role in this uh, era? That my worthy opponent has to tell actually. No, they, they clearly indicated that certain clinical lesions which requires more. Yeah, so the for us, Dr. Stewart has given some idea yeah, that yeah. there are issues where OCA does play a very good role. And I think even today, I mean, if what about a patient who's allergic to fluorescein? You, what would you do? You do nothing. If OCTA is there to help you, and with peripheral OCTA, you can actually go ahead and pick up those treatments. If you have a patient who's got a CNVM, who's been getting treated, and now you're, you've got a certain level of changes on the OCTA, and now you want to know, is there a new deterrence? I think one of the quickest ways to pick it up is on, is on an OCTA. Fluorescein and the ICG will not be as effective as uh, as an OCK in that situation. So uh, there are enough indications. Now even peripheral uh, skin areas, I can avoid doing a, uh, a fluorescein angiography by, by, by having uh, ultrawide, uh, ultrawide imaging of, uh, with the OCTA. And so a lot of these changes which we are talking about on fluorescein and on ICG can be covered by OCTA. There's only, there are only very few patients where I would say, yes, uh, an FA would be needed. One, which I believe is especially important in our country, when I want to do a focal macular laser for a DME, I want to see those focal speaks, so even clinically I can pick them up. And that's where an FA gives me a very accurate picture. And that's one stage where I would definitely like to ICG yeah. for polyps, yes, so uh, as uh, Dr. Stuart himself showed, it is the OCT which is showing the difference, not the OCTA. OCTA is probably not, but for a BV, uh, BVN, uh, the branching vascular networks there, yes, those you pick up very easily on the uh, OCTA and very well. So, uh, and I think Dr. Sada has been the, one of the foremost opponents on OCTA, I hope you'll add something more to this. No, no I, I agree with everything that you said. I, I, I think it's very clear, as our, our two speakers very eloquently argued, that uh, you know OCTA can't replace dye-based angiography. But I think there are definitely indications where it's clearly superior and is beneficial. One, obviously, is in assessing non-perfusion, especially in the macula. So diabetic macular ischemia, there's no question it's it's much better and there's no reason to get a fluorescein for that purpose anymore. Uh, the other setting where I think it's invaluable uh, is in the setting of pachychoroid diseases where sometimes you have a lot of RP alterations, they're staining. It's very difficult to distinguish between leakage related to the, to the central serous kind of component versus the neovascularization. And so I think in that setting, it can be very useful as well. And tomorrow I'll argue for the benefit of evaluating the chorea capillaris using OCTA, which is not something we can do sufficiently well, I think, with dye-based angiography. In fact, no, oh, I think even what we talk about the changes in the FAZ on the fluorescein angiography, on the OCTA, you realize that a lot more changes are happening in the deep plexus, which you don't get to know. 
on the floor scenography. And the changes in, in the even in terms of the microalgorithms, how they are evolving, how they are going up, all those things we pick up better on an OCE A than we pick up on the floor scenography. So there are definitely uh, there is a, a, a role, and while I may not immediately die without it, but there are indications, there are situations where it has helped me to improve my patient care. Yeah, this particular topic actually highlights having both the modalities in place. Actually, either OCTA or OCT oblique FA are not going to get replaced by OCTA. So you, here it's very clearly coming out that we need to have both the modalities for future. When you are evaluating the superficial lesion, especially when it is involved with the physiology, probably OCTA. OCT and FA are more scoring high. When you are evaluating the deeper lesions and where, when there is a structural <laughs> predominance is there, OCT scores high over OCT and FA. So it, it's not a clear emergent either of these are superior and you cannot, can do anything with it. It's not possible. So I argued against fluorescent and geography for the treatment of macular edema. And I'll give you a counterpoint to your point because Historically, we've always lasered two areas of leaking and found angiography, found microangiograms on angiography. So the counterpoint I would give you is that OCTA is a great way to pick up or microangiograms. I think we all agree on that. Diffuse leaking, no, that comes better from fluorescent angiography. But when I put a contact lens on the patient and I look at areas of thickening, then I think it's a pretty good assessment to correlate thickening with diffuse leaking and do a grid in that area. So I'm, I'm not sure the fluorescein adds much uh, because I think what it does is it reinforces what I'm seeing in terms of clinical exam. Sir, uh, I think at the baseline we should have an FA and OCTA both, and on subsequent follow-ups, I think OCTA is a better way to follow the patient, but we would be then avoiding in giving injection to the I think that's a better way to follow. Sir, uh, one more uh, as the vice panel is suggesting, the it is not going to replace uh, the dye based tools. It is actually adding more things like the follow up. You can you do need not to give the dye, the entirety of intermediate CNVM uh, that one picks up with the OCT NGO is far more better than as compared to the fluorescein dye. Uh, while looking at the overall use of the ICG as compared to a OCT NGO for the choroidal lesions, more or less it has some way replaced. Uh, you need not use the ICG NGO and uh, ICG angiography in most of the cases. OCT NGO does the job for you. For CSRs, if you are using the swept source OCT NGO, in most of the cases when the blood flow is optimal, at the time you are doing the scanning, it more often or not picks up the CSR lesion. I would say 6 to 7 out of 10, not for the 10 out of 10 CSR cases. Yeah, that is the problem where we are limited with the OCT NGO at the moment. Uh, congratulations. Uh, congratulations to the panel. It's a very nice presentation. Also, the wise, uh, a lot of nice comments. I think one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that FA only assess the superficial capillary plexus. In OCTA, it, you can actually see the deep, intermediate, and deep. That's, that's imp an important information because it, it's a completely different information. One, in OCTA, you're actually seeing not a, 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 a lack of, of flow, but a slow flow. So that you have to have to bear in mind because this is important information, especially treating patients with RVO and diabetes in these cases. But I think today um, it's really difficult to, as you mentioned, it's difficult to leave without OCTA. And when you're doing that, you're actually not only using OCTA, you're using cross-sectional B-scan OCT and also UNFAS. UNFAS gives a lot of information that we're not common in here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Charu Gupta. She's going to present her paper on white field OCT angiography in CRVO. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, so it's important to differentiate between ischemic and non-ischemic CRVO because NBG tends to develop in nearly 23% of the ischemic uh, of the eyes. After 15 months, it tends to become ischemic. However, in the development of NBG is rare in non-ischemic CRVO. OCT is a good non-invasive, easily repeatable imaging modality for patients of CRVO who have comorbidities. 
So the purpose of the study was to detect vascular abnormalities in CR blood using wide field swept source OCTD to compare the findings with wide field fundus angiography and to study the temporal wedge pattern of capillary long occlusion seen on the wide field 12 by 12 image and the montage headsets to detect ischemic CR blood. So it was a retrospective observation and analysis. We diagnosed, we took in cases of a CR bio, more than 50 years of age, and then we could get a good quality uh, montage of 12 by 12, 5 images. And they were also included if they had a previous treatment history for the same pathology. Exclusion criteria were presence of other pathologies like diabetic retinopathy, ARND, refractive error, more than six characters, and poor image quality. The investigations that were uh, assessed were medical history of the patient, best selected visual acuity, scan OCT, and wide field uh, fundus angiography, and previous episodes CA montage in present were recorded from the files. A qualitative and quantitative analysis of the scans was done. Presence of absence of the temporal wedge was noted. So the temporal wedge was defined as a triangular shaped CNP area extending from the temporal periphery with apex towards the macula. This was seen on the earlier like in the montage and also on the 12 by 12 in some cases. A flow overlay was done to confirm the lack of perfusion in these areas. The images were then analyzed and compared. So with the MATLAB, we made sure that the correlation between the fundus angiography and the OCTA images, but the, the quality was good enough to be correlated. Once that was done, the quantitative analysis was done using a grid-based area calculation software. The image was uploaded, the size and the disk diameter was defined. Manually selected area was done, thus calculated using software and it divided by 2.25 to get the CNP areas. So this is how you manually uh, 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 drew the area. The results, the third, we studied 38 eyes of 38 patients, 7 were uh, females and uh, 31 were males. The mean age was 65 years. So the on results we found that when qualitatively comparing the FA with OCTA, with the OCTA montage enabled us to detect the venous atrocity very well. We could see capillary engorgement, telangiectatic vessels, and even the collateral vessels were well, uh, were well delineated. Uh, comparing quanti uh, qualitatively, even the CNP area, you see even point-to-point -point correlation of the uh, white field OCT, uh, white field angiography and the OCT is very good. And quantitatively, uh, we found that the CNP areas on both were comparable. The unpaired t-test uh, was not significant. Um, sequential scans, 16 patients had sequential scans. Of these, four remained as non-ischemic to the follow-up, seven progressed from non-ischemic to ischemic, and in five, the areas of ischemia incre increased. On quant uh, quantitatively comparing the CNP areas between the first and the final visit, sequential uh, OCTA did not show significant progression. So this is the follow-up OCTA, the patient stayed stable, though the macular edema had increased. This is another patient in which uh, was a CL, uh, CRDO with a severe retinal artery into the, uh, uh, occlusion. And within six weeks, there's a marked increase in the CNP areas on the OCTA montage. This is a patient three months down the line on the OCTA 12 by 12. You're able to see that the non-ischemic is changing to ischemic. And it's already coming on. The wedge pattern is seen in the macular area. This is another patient which came as ischemic. And over a, a follow-up, after two months, the area of ischemia has increased. This would be a high tendency to develop neovascular glaucoma. The temporal wedge was documented in 18 of the 38 patients on the SSA OCTM montage and in 16 of them on the 12 by 12. So uh, this is what you see. And then on this 12 by 12, you see you can see the same wedge pattern that is coming up. So comparing the deep plexus, telangiectatic vessels, and capillary drought valves are better documented on the deep capillary plexus as compared to the superficial in 15 patients. So this is the superficial plexus on the left-hand side and the deep plexus on the right. You see the many more CNP areas of non-perfusion that you see and the engorgement also is much more marked. Again, this is another comparison of the superficial and the deep plexus. So FFA is definitely the gold standard imaging modality to document non-perfusion areas in CRBO. Limitations, of course, that it, when there are extensive hemorrhages, it, it is difficult to interpret, and it's very difficult to repeat in some of these patients. Uh, there's a study which shows that the vessel density on the deep text of the 3 by 3 uh, scan was found to be a good indicator. So this is a study in 20 by 22. But this was only done once the macular edema regressed. We could differentiate it even in the presence of macular edema. Why the wedge is a very interesting uh, observation. So it could be possibly related to the way the blood supply comes. So probably the segmentation of the choroidal arterial system, they found that this wedge, it has a wedge shape filling pattern. So we are not very sure, but possibly this could be the reason why we're seeing this wedge.
the weakness of the study is of course that you require a cooperative patient and artifacts especially in white field are much more common in conclusion i would like to say is that the octa montage compared very well to the gold standard ffa in imaging the vascular abnormality in crvo including uh, ischemic progression it has an ability to image image the temporal wedge on the montage and the posterior ex extension of the wedge on a single central 12 by 12 scan could be helpful in identifying a conversion of a non ischemic crvo to ischemic crvo being on non intervention it could be a useful imaging modality in crvo to identify these patients who could then undergo ffa if there's no other contraindication thank you I have two comments. Uh, excellent paper, Dr. Charu, but I have two comments. Uh, one thing is that uh, you have analyzed the uh, area of the non-perfusion, which I find can be easily identified on FFA as well. But where OCTA would scare, score more is on the quantitative analysis. If you do a quantitative analysis of the vascular density and perfusion density, you will have more, in, more information on OCTA as compared to FFA. And of course, on follow-up also, you can see the changes in the BDPD and you can make out whether it is changing from non-ischemic to ischemic. So that is one. And second thing is that you have also included cases which had previous history of treatment. So would you not think that the treatment would, uh, you know, change your uh, uh, you know, ischemia or the progression to ischemia? That would affect the progression, isn't yeah, it? But we can still document the progression, so even despite treatment. So treatment could be for the macular edema, but it's a non-ischemic CRV you're treating for macular edema. It has a chance to go into ischemia. So that's what we that's what we're trying to say that mm -hmm. non-ischemic going on to ischemia is also something we need. We always have to look out. No, I mean to say it may not progress to ischemia if you're treating with anti -vagia. But but we also see the other way around that even despite treatment it progresses, so we have to catch them. As far as the density, yes, we are working on that too. Uh, very nice paper, Dr. Charu. Just an observation uh, that temporal wedge is a very nice observation, but uh, in my practice, generally I do a ultra wide field angiography in CRVO patients when I'm planning to maybe augment with some laser. So I want to identify the capillary non perfusion areas. And many of many times I find them all over, not just in the temporal area. But from your images, it seems that they're mostly focused there. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I said. Whether it is because we're separating the superficial and a deep, that's why we've got it. So that's one of the. Uh, feelings that I got because that it's become more evident because we've separated the plexuses. So because yeah, even we never noticed it in the pre OCT era, but now we seem to see it much more. Uh, Charu, did you do, happen to do the electrophysiological comparison no. in these cases? No. Because most of the studies now we are uh, almost ignoring electrophysiology. Are we done away with electrophysiology in predicting? Because the previous all studies have shown that uh, the electrophysiological evaluation is best predictor for transforming into ischemia. So you could have incorporated that as well in your study. Yeah, thank you. Acharu. Next, can I invite Dr. Nivesh uh, for uh, presenting his paper on non-inferiority of fundus findings on images taken uh, with a wide field imaging system in comparison with Charting drawings. Non infinity of fundus finding on images taken on wide field imaging system in comparison to charting drawings in eyes having regmatogenous detachment. Disclosure, Dr. Manish Nag Nagpal, consultant, 19. On introduction, breaks in regmatogenous detachment are classically documented by fundus charting. The concept of wide field imaging enables us to capture the peripheral areas of retina. Various existing wide field imaging systems are Optos and Claris. The Optos ultra wide field imaging system has proved to have high sensitivity and clinical utility for detecting pathology throughout the fundus, including posterior pool. Recently introduced Mirante with 163 degree wide field imaging with single image capture based on scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. Ultra wide field imaging helps us to document peripheral pathologies such as horseshoe tear and lattice degeneration. Purpose of our study to compare the fundus findings using wide field imaging by scanning laser ophthalmoscopy based imaging objectively with the standard fundus charting drawn using 
इनडायरेक्ट ऑप्थेलमोस्कोपी सब्जेक्टिवली इन पेशेंट हैविंग रेगमोटोजिनस डिटैचमेंट मटेरियल मेथड्स वी इंक्लूडेड 27 सेवन आईज ऑफ ट्वेंटी सेवन पेशेंट्स व रेफरटेड टू आर टर्शरी केयर सेंटर फ्रॉम वेरियस इंस्टीट्यूट हु आर डायग्नोज टू हैव रेगमोटिजिनस डिटैचमेंट इन स्टेप वन वाइट फील्ड फोटोग्राफी एट प्रजेंटेशन द पेशेंट वर डॉक्यूमेंटेड टू वाइट फील्ड फोटोग्राफी एज अ पार्ट ऑफ आर रूटीन स्क्रीनिंग डन बाय रेटना फेलोज एंड स्टेप टू थोरो ऑप्थेलमोलॉजिकल एग्जामिनेशन वॉज डन with uh, <clears throat> indirect ophthalmoscopy with uh, senior consultant and simultaneously fundus charting were drawn then we compare both uh, fundus charting with the white field photography we see the few examples for the same in this image we showing retinoidal detachment with far peripheral hole at 9 o'clock in this uh, image we showing horseshoe tear at 2 o'clock and in this image we showing a Sub total retinal detachment with far peripheral breaks. In this uh, image, we are showing a, a tear around four o'clock, and interestingly, uh, we also found a small break on by the machine. We documented a tabulated form in of all cases, uh, extent, location, and number of type of break and associated finding. We found that twenty six patient had. regmatitis attachment of one patient and retinoschisis all clinical findings between the two were matching equally in our series in more than uh, one break was found in 77% of cases we also found that average time to was taken to chart to fundus charting was up to 15 to 20 minutes but while uh, on file field photography it can take only 2 to 5 minutes in our study we documented the extent of retinal detachment through slo based white field imaging with single image capture detachments have been documented well on optos and clarus but to the best of our knowledge a similar comparison has not been done between subjective charting and objective white field imaging uzuki et al revealed that under the white field fundus imaging has a sensitivity of 97.6% and a specificity of 96.5% for detecting retinoidal detachments we concluded slo based white field imaging documentation was found to be non inferior to the traditional subjective and time consuming art of fundus charting in the near future white field imaging may become a useful tool for diagnosis surgical planning and follow up of retinoidal detachments thank you thank you uh, i have a question for dr ajit uh, babu sir do you think Uh, it will these 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 <coughs> white field uh, is in any way a substitute for the scleral depression and and seeing if the break will settle on the buccal what what is your take on the uh, is, are we degrading our clinical skills pre clinical pre surgical uh, planning definitely wide angles will show you all the breaks but the dynamics of uh, intra surgical evaluation or application in the pre operative uh, decision making definitely it's not because it will show you the break but the dynamics of the indentation or how much is the traction counter traction that need to be applied especially while uh, the one of the fundus photograph with multiple breaks it's a very good case for scleral buckling how many of you really go for scleral buckling in the pre clinical evaluation this will be answered very clearly uh and it need to be uh, done otherwise both pre clinical evaluation as well as the art of scleral buckling are dying uh, my, uh, can you uh, turn on the microphone please yeah so the conclusion should come with a lot of uh, uh, conditions it's a conditional conclusion so non inferiority only in cases which are cooperative patients adult patients where the media is clear only in those you can compare uh, this uh, imaging with uh, this uh, this thing if a patient is a is a child you know pediatric patients with a hazy media how can you even compare it is definitely going to be non inferior so you have to have those limitations to your study and second thing is whether the examiner who did the indirect ophthalmoscopy was he blinded yes. to the image that must be mentioned because yes. if he has already seen the image then obviously it is going to be the same in the drawing nobody is going to sit and look for more breaks no, so he was yeah. blinded and later on unblinding was
chat. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll invite all the speakers and the wise council up for a group photograph and then we can disperse. Thank you.